Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight. The Georgetown Law Students for Democratic Reform are excited to welcome you to tonight's event, a conversation with Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton on DC statehood and voting rights. First off, we would like to thank Congresswoman Norton for graciously speaking with us tonight about these important and timely issues, and Professor Francois for moderating this event. We would also like to thank the Georgetown Law ACLU for co-sponsoring this event. We would like to remind you that tonight's event is being recorded and will be made available in the coming days. We will try to reserve 10 minutes for questions, so feel free to post your questions in the Q&A portion of the chat. Granting equal representation to the more than 700,000 mostly black and brown residents of DC is one of the most important civil rights issues facing our nation today. In just the past year, DC residents were denied critical coronavirus relief funding, faced violence during protests for racial justice, and endured an insurrection incited by the former president. The district's lack of autonomy in these instances points to the urgent need to make DC the 51st state. And the disenfranchisement of DC residents cannot be separated from the national efforts to deny representation to people of color. We are now witnessing renewed efforts to deny voting rights to black and brown Americans on the state level throughout the country, fueled by the myth of widespread voter fraud. Thanks to the leadership of Congresswoman Norton and the hard work of grassroots organizers, the US House of Representative passed, Representatives passed HR 51, the Washington DC Admission Act last week. And in March, the House passed HR 1, the For the People Act, which would expand voting access and partisan gerrymandering and increase transparency and accountability in Washington. The fate of these bills, however, remains uncertain in the Senate. GLSDR is proud to work on these issues and fight for a fairer, more representative democracy. We look forward to discussing these issues at this evening's event. Our moderator for this event is Professor Adderson Francois. Professor Francois is the Anne Fleming Research Professor at Georgetown Law, Director of the Voting Rights Institute, and the Director of the Civil Rights Section of the Institute for Public Representation. His scholarly interests include voting rights, education law, and the history of slavery and reconstruction. In 2008, Professor, or President Barack Obama's transition team appointed Professor Francois as, as lead agency reviewer for the United States Commission on Civil Rights. He has testified before Congress on civil rights issues and filed numerous briefs at the US Supreme Court and state Supreme Courts. And we are especially excited to welcome Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton Congresswoman Norton is now in her 15th term as the representative for the District of Columbia. She serves on the Committee on Oversight and Reform in the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure and is the chair of the Subcommittee on Highways and Transit. Prior to her congressional service, she served as the Assistant Legal Director of the ACLU, specializing in free speech and sex discrimination cases. In 1970, she joined the New York University Law School faculty and was appointed the head of New York City's Human Rights Commission. In 1977, she became the first woman to chair the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And in 1982, she became a professor here at Georgetown Law. She has served in Congress since 1990, where she has been a champion of civil and human rights and brought significant economic benefits to her DC constituents. Congresswoman Norton has been fighting for DC statehood for more than 30 years and introduced the DC statehood bill for the first time during her first term in Congress. Thank you again, Congresswoman Norton for joining us. I will now hand things over to Professor Francois. Thank you so much, Alex, uh, and welcome everyone. And welcome again, Congresswoman uh, Norton. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, the main topic of our discussion today obviously is uh, DC statehood. Um, but before we get into that, I was hoping you could share with the audience a little bit about the fact that you serve currently as a delegate representing DC in the US as a representatives. And I was wondering if you could share with us what is the process for becoming a delegate and what powers do you exercise as a delegate in the House and how does that differ from um, other members of Congress? Well, I appreciate that question because it's, it's an important question to get straight. Um, the member from the district, it can be labeled either a, uh, a uh, congresswoman or, or a delegate. I don't like the name delegate because some state officials, uh, state representatives are called de delegates. So most people call me congresswoman 
there is really no difference between me and other members of Congress except for one important difference. And that difference is that when the final vote is taken on the House floor, even if the matter affects only the District of Columbia, everybody can vote on it except the member from the District of Columbia. My statehood bill, of course, would grant us the same rights as, as everyone else, but I do want uh, Georgetown law students to know that I have every right that other members have. I chair a subcommittee. I even vote on the House floor in the Committee of the Whole when Democrats are in power as they are now. Uh, but I want what every jurisdiction is entitled to, especially a jurisdiction like my own, which pays the highest federal taxes per capita. Remember that number, the highest federal taxes per capita in the United States. Uh, thank you, Congressman Norton. Over the last few weeks, we've been privy to a lot of debates about DC statehood. Uh, much of it has been, at least from some members of Congress, done in bad faith. And we can sort of put those, the statements aside. So my first question to you is, if you were speaking to an audience with a good faith open mind, what is the best case you would make as to why DC deserves statehood and full and equal representation in Congress? I suppose the best case is that the residents of their nation's capital have a more uh, residents uh, than two states, which all, all have two senators and a voting rep representative, about seven states have about the population equivalent to the District of Columbia. The best case by far though, is that the district pays the highest federal taxes per capita in the United States. And it is that case, which I think has brought more, more people to DC statehood than anything else. Um, if you look at where residents of the United States stand 54%, that's an important number, 54% of the American people now support DC statehood. How did it get to be that way? Uh, largely because people learned what they did not know about their own capital. Some thought we had the same rights they had, others didn't know, uh, they were all over the map but the hearings informed the American people. And that those hearings and the markup made them understand. And so we get to 58% agree that DC should, should be made a state when taxation without representation is presented. That includes 42% of Republicans. And it is really quite evenly divided. It's college and non-college educated students, it's young and old, it's black and white voters. It's very much uh, across the board. In swing states, 57% uh, 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 of the American people uh, support DC statehood. So you can look at it from many different angles, uh, but the latest statistics, and by the way, the poll I was quoting from was very detailed. If you look at the latest statistics which inform people about their own nation's capital, what apparently few did not know, I think if anything, I may have, I, I may have confused people because I go on the floor often to speak as I can. I can do everything any other member can do except that final vote. But most of the time I'm talking about legislation. Of course, I'm often talking about DC statehood and DC home rule and matters affecting the district. But most of the time I'm simply talking about the bills that are on the floor for the day. 
The DC statehood bill has helped the American people focused on the District of Columbia itself and the rights it does not have. Uh, thank you. Congressman, I wonder if you can sort of explore that a little bit. Um, because one of the things that you emphasize is this notion that DC pays the highest per capita in terms of taxation, and yet DC is not represented in Congress. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the difference between, say, granting DC residents representation in Congress, giving them the right to vote without necessarily granting DC statehood. I'm sorry, granting DC what? DC residents. In other words, is there a difference in your mind or could you conceive an instance in which DC residents have, are able to vote, to have a full voting representation without necessarily DC itself being a state? Yeah, we have tried that. We've tried to get voting rights for the District of Columbia. We've simply not been able to get that. And when we weren't able to get that, we said, why not go for, for full equality for statehood itself? We've tried many iterations mm -hmm. to try to get the district at least uh, some of the rights that other Americans have, but there's no reason now uh, to focus on anything about full equality for the residents of our nation's capital. Um, the other point I wanted to raise with you, if you could, um, and give you a chance to respond, is that those folks who are opposed to DC statehood will sometimes point out that while it is true that DC pays taxes without representation, it is also true that DC gets um, some unique forms of support from the federal government that other states do not get. For example, um, outside of juvenile cases, DC itself doesn't have to run its own criminal justice system. The public defender service in DC, which is reputed to be the single best public defender service in the country, is fully funded by the federal government, as opposed to being funded by DC. So some folks will point out that DC does have some advantages by being DC that other states don't have. It is certainly true that um, the district does not pay for everything, but that is quite beside the point for statehood because the district is fully prepared to pay for everything a state would pay for, uh, including what government pays for because we are the nation's capital or because the federal government or the Congress has refused to give the district home rule. So there's no hesit hesitancy on the part of the district to pay for everything a state pays for. In fact, the district is doing very well. Uh, more people want to live in the district than the district can, can has places for. Uh, young people, for example, are living uh, on in, in the apartments that were created for a couple of people, sometimes four or five in one apartment. Part of the reason for that is that the district cannot build high because it is the nation's capital and there has to be room left for the capital monument, places of that kind to be seen. Uh, so that we're impacted into a, uh, an, a the area which we now hold. Uh, and that area will hold as many people as we can get, including many who uh, want to live in the, in, in, in the district. You indicated, by the way, and I should correct this about the district being majority black. The next census will probably show that the district is once again majority white. For most of its existence, uh, that's 220 years, the district has been a majority white city. That's important to remember because we didn't even have home rule when it was majority white. We certainly don't have statehood and it's going back to being majority white again, I predict because of the next census. Um, the Congress was reluctant to give the district the same rights as others, no matter what race the majority uh, seemed to have. It became majority black 
for the first time only in the 1970s. And now it's very close back to where it has always been a majority white city. Mm -hmm. So in terms as a practical matter, if DC were to achieve statehood, um, again, for the benefit of the audience, um, how would you imagine, how do you envision working out the practical realities of the actual seat of the federal government? The actual what? The, re the practical reality of how to deal with the relationship between DC as a state and the need for the federal government to exercise dominion over the actual seat of government. The statehood bill carves out 10 uh, square miles uh, that people think of as the capital as the capital, we call it capital. Mm -hmm. uh, but our eight wards would be the District of Columbia. That's all we want. And does the carve out essentially track the map that um, DC had come up with, I recall, during the last drafting of his constitution back in 2016, if I recall? Yes, and we, that was carved out then. 86% of the DC residents supported statehood. We carved out that uh, th those uh, that track between the Capitol and the monument with all the federal buildings, the places that people come and think of as the Capitol, that would remain under the jurisdiction of the federal government. Okay. And as a last question, before we turn to the politics of it all, I take it from your answers to my prior question that you would absolutely reject um, the claim that the solution to giving DC representation is to simply have the territory that is now DC um, to sort of retrocess into Maryland. <laughs> well, Maryland, uh, Maryland gave the land in perpetuity for the nation's capital. Every member of Congress, the two senators, uh, all of the Maryland representatives, including leader Steny Hoyer, who has, by the way, written an op-ed in the Washington Post for DC statehood. All of the House members support statehood except the lone Republican. And, and uh, Maryland's um, gift uh, to DC cannot be taken back at this time because it gave it uh, without condition. Mm -hmm. Back in, I believe, the early 19, uh, 1990, while President Clinton uh, was in office, there was a fairly big lawsuit that was brought. A what? Um, a lawsuit that was brought to seek to get DC residents a representation in the House. In fact, um, the lawsuit was rejected and the person who had the majority opinion uh, was actually then Judge Garland. Um, and one of the things that was discussed in the opinion was that from the 1790s on, DC residents actually voted, even after they had been given to DC, DC residents actually voted in Virginia and Maryland elections for Congress. Yes, the, the uh, <laughs> DC residents did continue to vote. Uh, <laughs> uh, and indeed, when the land finally reverted to the federal government to become the nation's capital, the residents of those states protested that they had lost their vote because they had become part of the nation's mm -hmm. capital. It was a real double cross. <laughs> and uh, they had every reason to support the, suppose they wouldn't lose their representation simply because they gifted land for the nation's capital. Yeah. I think sometimes it surprises people to know that when the so-called seat of government clause was drafted, there was virtually no discussion at all anywhere in the debate that showed that folks intended for the residents um, in DC not to be able to vote. 
that that was an issue that was never, ever, ever settled. Um, so it's always interesting when folks talk about what the quote unquote founders intended, since in fact that was an issue that was actually never debated at all. There's simply- That's an important point. That's a very important point. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, so I wonder if we can, can turn to the politics of it all, um, because in preparing you know, for our discussion, I was reviewing um, some of the things that I've been working on. And it would surprise people that for a long time, many Republicans in Congress actually were fully in support of DC having full voting rights. Uh, it, it, none other than former Senator Owen Hatch even published an article in the Harvard Law Review, basically advocating for full representation. But now it seems as if there's near complete unanimous opposition by the Republican Party for statehood. Um, how do you explain that? How do you account that change? I don't know how to explain it except the polarization of the Congress and the fact that we now want to be a state. You've had DC, you've had Republicans supporting full voting rights uh, as long back as the 50s for full voting rights for DC residents for Republicans, and remember, Republicans controlled the House uh, often and tried to get it. It was Democrats, mostly some of the uh, Southern Democrats uh, who stood in the way of full representation through the vote. Mm -hmm. So looking at the sort of political landscape right now, we know that um, the bill passed the House. Um, How do you how do you see um, things proceedings in the Senate as we as we see here today? Well, I have every reason to be hopeful in the Senate. The Senate was late organizing this year uh, because of one issue, and that was uh, the filibuster. Democrats know they got control of the Senate narrowly, but they have control of the Senate really because. Republicans let the filibuster stand in the way of getting anything done. So the people gave the Senate to the Democrats. The Democrats tried, in fact, held up organization in an effort to get rid of the filibuster. Uh, they did not succeed, but it does show that uh, they are determined if they want to stay in power and get anything done to get rid of uh, of, the, of the filibuster. So I'm very hopeful because if the filibuster goes for anything else, it'll have to go for DC statehood too. So if, if that were to, to happen, as many folks have pointed out, the reality of DC demographics is that the moment that DC becomes a state, the Democratic Party is guaranteed <laughs> to have two additional Democratic senators, you know, for the foreseeable future, which would radically, arguably change the balance of power. Um, do you think that's an insurmountable obstacle, the fact that granting DC statehood would automatically change the balance of power of the Senate? Certainly not insurmountable. It is true that most states have become I, we're given statehood two at a time. It was thought one was Democratic, one was Republican. Hawaii and Alaska were the last two. And by the way, they mm -hmm. flipped soon after. Mm -hmm. The difficulty for the district, of course, is that it, it doesn't have a partner. And so it's going one by one, one at a time rather. But look where we are, 54% uh, support DC statehood, even without a partner. Well, I guess there's arguably a partner, but that partner would also be Democratic. Puerto Rico could arguably be a partner, right? Who? Puerto Rico? Well, Puerto Rico's delegate is Republican, uh, but most people believe Puerto Rico would be Democratic. Yeah, yeah. And has there been any talk at all of having DC achieve statehood while still maintaining a balance in the Senate, perhaps by splitting a Republican state? Or is that too fanciful to even consider? By doing what? 
by splitting a Republican state. By splitting a Republican seat, so the one would have to be? By splitting a Republican state into two. What, what Republican state would that be? I can imagine Texas, for example. There's been no talk of that and no, no state wants to be split in order to help DC. So that's not even on the table. Mm -hmm. So as we sit here today, you are hopeful that in fact, DC stands a chance assuming we get rid of the filibuster. We've gotten rid of the filibuster for everything except legislation. We got rid of it for, for nominations and I think DC stands a very good chance if we get rid of the filibuster because it would have to be my majority vote. Mm -hmm. um, so other than what we know to be Republican opposition right now, um, what else do you see as the main obstacles to DC statehood? Republican opposition alone is the major obstacle to statehood. Uh, the 54% that I indicated earlier shows you that we already have a majority of the American people. And we expect that number to keep going up the more exposure we give to DC statehood, just as we did this past week when we passed another bill. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I know that you mentioned earlier that in the next census, there is a chance that DC might once again become majority white. Uh, but unless I'm mistaken, in the last census, DC still remains majority black, or at least plurality black. Is that correct? Although it was very close then to even, but yes, that is correct. Uh, so if DC would become, were to become a state, it certainly would be the first state in the country that is majority black. Um, that is what? Majority black. It would, well, majority, yes, yeah. but and I'm, not, I'm not sure. Go ahead. Um, and um, do you think there would be any sort of significance to that? I don't. Uh, as I indicated, for most of his existence, the district was majority white. That didn't seem to help us at all. Okay. Because what I'm struck about is that the case that you're making for DC becoming a state is different than that which others have made for it. Because a lot of folks um, talk of DC statehood almost as a question of racial justice. But at the beginning of our conversation, you simply emphasize not the issue of racial justice, but simply the plain fact that DC pays more um, taxes per capita than any other uh, uh, state in the country. So I'm curious to know whether or not um, you're making the case, you're not making the case for DC statehood based on questions of racial justice is simply a political stance or whether or not you believe it is simply not the best case for DC statehood? It's impossible to avoid the notion that we have more African-Americans here than other states that have become states of, of, of the union. But the reason I don't make the case based on race is because the, the, the case against DC having even home rule didn't have anything to do with race. Uh, so I certainly applaud the notion that many people would like to see a state that had many African-Americans become a state of the union. I applaud that. It is hardly a reason to support DC statehood. Mm -hmm. One of the main questions that have come to us in preparation for this discussion given that this is Georgetown is that students are really curious and they want to know as a practical matter, what can they do? What steps can they take right now to support? Well, I had hoped to hear from students. Exactly. Particularly they want to since, what, I, but particularly what, what, since, particularly since uh, I rejoice in the fact that I was a full-time tenured professor uh, at 
when I taught full time just before coming to Congress at Georgetown. So some of my best memories are as a professor of law at Georgetown. Now Georgetown students come from throughout the university. It's an internet, it's a national indeed an international university and law school. So be, because they come from probably every state in the union, uh, they could do something. They could make sure that their relatives uh, uh, write uh, or email their senators to have them lobby for DC statehood. Um, other than um, talking back to their residents back home, are there any other steps you can think of that they can take to help the push for DC statehood? Excuse me? Um, you mentioned that one of the things that students can do is to talk to their folks back home, talk to representatives back right. home. But now when, when they're in Georgetown, when they're in DC, particularly right now, are there any actions that they can take to support the move for DC? Well, yes, there's a, there is an organization here called DC Vote, which often asks people to come out or to go online with them uh, to promote DC statehood. So, they, they are a very, very effective organization right here in the District of Columbia. Um, lastly, in terms of DC statehood, because I know the students also wanted us to talk a little bit more broadly about voting rights in general. Um, and, but one of the questions that they were hoping that I would ask you is given that you've been um, in Congress since 1990, and given that you've studied the issue of DC statehood for even a longer period of time, in your view, how has the debate over DC statehood changed or evolved, if at all, since you were first elected to Congress? Well, the debate has changed because we've tried many iterations of ways to get full equality. So sometimes we were talking about voting rights. Uh, now, of course, we're talking about statehood depending on how the Congress looked, we have tried in many ways, many diverse ways to get at least some representation. Now with Democrats in control of the House, Senate and presidency, it makes no sense to do anything except go for the full enchilada, statehood for the residents of the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. Um, I know at some point students may join the discussion in terms of any question about this statehood, but I wanted us to at least have a chance also to talk more broadly about voting rights. And the reason why is that on the one hand, DC statehood would certainly uh, result in a large expansion of voting rights, if you will. But at the same time, we've been seeing since the election of November or push around the country by many, many states um, to restrict voting rights, to ad adopt measures, if you will, that would limit access to the um, ballot, ballot box. And I guess my broad question for you is that, can you speak a little, about, a little bit about your view of the current state of voting rights in America right now? Well, we now are in the midst of something of a revolution when it comes to voting rights. We see people in the streets saying Black Lives Matter. A lot of that is about voting rights. We see people taking down Confederate statutes. Uh, statues. Uh, we see uh, more and more uh, Americans uh, supporting voting rights uh, nationally in the Congress of the United States. This is a issue that affects not only DC residents, but increasingly the country at large. And do you perceive from your position in Congress that in fact there is a mood in Congress to sort of expand voting rights? Uh, yes, of course. Um, the Voting Rights Act, for example, uh, is the latest uh, um, statute to try to expand 
voting rights throughout the United States. Okay. Um, we're starting to get some questions from the audience. Um, and there are two main questions that so far folks are interested in asking you. The first has to do with the 23rd Amendment. Um, and the question is whether or not you believe or you perceive that the 23rd Amendment might serve as an obstacle or does it serve as an obstacle or difficulty in achieving DC statehood? Well, that's about all Republicans have to hang their, ha their hat on. Uh, the district in 1960 did get uh, the right to vote for president through the 23rd Amendment. Now, if we get statehood, we that, that gave us three electoral votes. If we got statehood, we'd have to do something with those electoral votes. Uh, my bill, my DC statehood bill, uh, does nullify the enabling statute, but since the 23rd Amendment occurred uh, through a constitutional change, there would have to be a constitutional change to get rid of it. My own prediction is that this would be the fastest amendment ever passed, an amendment uh, to get rid of the 23rd Amendment, which would apply only to the president. Of course, he votes other places and homeless. So I think that amendment would sail through the country faster than any amendment you've ever seen. Certainly, faster, certainly faster than the 23rd Amendment did to, in the first place. Why do you suppose that would be the case? <laughs> well, because you would have uh, a redundancy there with the homeless being able to vote, for example, that's all that's left in that strip of land. Uh, and that redundancy, uh, Republicans would be the first to want to wipe out since you, we can't have three electoral votes through statehood and then have another three electoral votes left over from the uh, 23rd Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, we'll leave that question. Another question that we're getting from the audience is, other than the 23rd Amendment, what other constitutional obstacles do you see to achieving statehood? Uh, uh, for the life of me, and I think any constitutional scholar who was honest would say the 23rd Amendment is the only constitutional impediment and that's easily dealt with. Um, the next question in the queue is the following. Um, Congressman Norton has proposed DC statehood for many years including other times with unified democratic control, 2009, for example. But it seems like now it is receiving more attention and seems closer to reality than ever before. What makes this time different as opposed to say 2009? Uh, in 2009, I did try to get um, statehood, but it looked like because we control the House and the Senate that we'd have a better chance of getting um, representatives uh, a, a House vote. And that's where, that's what we tried to do. In fact, I got that bill through the House and the Senate and we would at least have a House vote, except that uh, the Republicans uh, attached an amendment that would have wiped out all of the district's gun safety laws. So I had to leave that House vote on the table. Um, do you perceive that there might be a sim do you anticipate there might be a similar tactic, for example, in the Senate? Do I perceive what? Do you anticipate there will be a similar tactic in the Senate? What tactic would that be? Um, attaching a poison pill to the bill, for example? No, I, I, I don't see that as what's holding us up in the Senate. So what's, holding us up, what's holding us up in the Senate is a filibuster, pure and simple. The Republicans have not come forward with any uh, other reason for us opposing DC statehood. Okay. So if I understand, just for the benefit of the audience then, the only way for DC statehood to occur then is if we get rid of the filibuster. Say that again. 
is it the only way that you anticipate this statehood will happen is for us to get, for the Senate to get rid of the filibuster? Certainly so. I, I don't see any legislation pass, passing without getting rid of the filibuster. That applies to DC statehood, but it applies to almost every other piece of legislation as well. Um, and what do you make of the fact that at least two Democratic senators seem to have come out pretty strongly in opposition to get re getting rid of the filibuster? I'm not particularly worried about that. Uh, we've got more than 90% of the Democratic senators actually co-sponsoring the bill. And I anticipate that we will make up for the uh, outliers in the Senate, and there are only a couple of them, by increasing the number of Democratic senators. And I think Biden and what he's doing will help us increase the number of Democratic senators, senators in the next Congress. So we're simply going to outvote them and outnumber them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next question is one that goes back to, to an issue that we begin to talk about. Um, and the question is as follows. We've often heard discussions of combining the issues of DC statehood and Puerto Rico statehood. Um, do you believe that DC statehood will be more or less likely if these issues are brought together or should these two movements remain separate? Well, we'd always be glad to have somebody to partner with. In Puerto Rico, we'd be very happy to partner with, but they haven't made up their mind yet on whether or not they want statehood. They'd have to pay for all the functions they don't have to pay for at this time. And they are in deliberations as I speak, their own delegation to the House on that matter is divided, but we'd be glad to partner with statehood if they're willing. I mean, with Puerto Rico, if, we're, if they're willing. Um, the next question that I have in the queue is, it's a very broad one and the question was as follows. What are some of the next steps that DC would have to undertake once it achieves statehood? What are, are the, oh, I'm sorry, that the district would have to take when? Once it achieves statehood. The district would have a period as other states have had called a transition period during which they would have time to take on all of the elements of statehood. We are asking for no more than every other state had, and that is that traditional transition period. Uh, how long would you anticipate that transition period to be? It differs. You have some states that it took more years than others. Nobody could tell you at this point, but states are given the latitude to in fact engage in what it would take to become whole as a state. And there is no time limit on it at all. Okay. Um, I'm just going through the questions to make sure that I give students a chance to participate. So my next question, the next question in the queue then would be, is not so much about um, the steps that DC would take, but given your long representation of DC in Congress and given your deep familiarity with DC politics, um, how would you anticipate the political dynamics of DC itself would change if it were to achieve statehood? The political dynamics? I'm not sure there would be much change in the political dynamics. We'd be the same people. We'd simply be a state. I, I suppose what I was getting at is right now, um, local politicians in DC don't run for the House and don't run for the Senate. I suppose if DC were to achieve statehood, um, the floodgates would open up, if you will. Um, and given your long experience, 
um, in DC politics, what would you predict would happen to DC politics? Well, first of all, the council would have immediately become the legislature uh, of the of the new state, and the mayor or governor would have to set a time limit for uh, a time period for people to run uh, for the office in the new state. Okay. Um, I think we've covered all the questions that the students have, and I suppose my last question is not really a question, but simply giving you the opportunity to um, have some closing thoughts for the students on this issue, because again, this is an issue that has been something like your life's work. And it sounds as if we are as close as we've ever been um, to achieving that dream, if you will. Um, and I wonder if you have any sort of final closing thoughts for the students as to where we are right now, and given that we stand so close to achieving statehood. I would say to, to students, particularly students at Georgetown uh, Law Center, where I myself was a tenured professor, that I have particularly appreciated the opportunity to talk with Georgetown students who come from all over the country, who have had many of them the benefit of living in states uh, which have the same rights as others. Now they come to law school, one of the great law schools, and they find that they better watch out because they're in a place that doesn't have the same rights. I hope that will lead Georgetown Law students to proselytize, if you will forgive the word, for DC statehood, telling people, for example, not only that we pay the highest taxes per capita in the United States, but that we have a budget that's larger than 12 states. We have a bond rating that is greater than 35 states. In other words, that the district is overqualified for statehood. So I've enjoyed talking with you. If you would continue to talk with others, particularly law students, whose questions show that they are well-versed uh, in the issue, uh, not only would I be appreciative, but I'm certain that the people I represent would also. Thank you, Congressman Norton. Uh, I want to turn things back now to Alex for some uh, closing thoughts, for any closing thoughts. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Francois, and thank you so much, um, Congresswoman Norton. For, um, we really appreciate you both joining us for this event um, on this really timely and interesting topic. Um, we just wanted to kind of send a shout out to people uh, here watching right now. Um, GLSDR is very active on this issue. We've planned a number of lobby days uh, on DC statehood where we've met with Democratic senators and some Republican senators um, trying to push them to support DC statehood. And as we see now, I believe the count is 46 Democratic co-sponsors in the Senate. So we're almost there and I think that we can get there. I also want to shout out a few of our members who are working with DC Vote right now, um, trying to figure out kind of legal uh, solutions to overcoming some of the 23rd Amendment uh, constitutional challenges that might arise. So that's something we've been involved in as well. Uh, we've done some uh, door knocking and um, handing out flyers. So I think if anybody wants to get involved in this issue, uh, we live in DC, we, we have a stake in this issue. Many of us will start our careers and maybe stay in DC for years to come. Um, and I just had one other question that I received from a friend who's watching. Um, curious, Congresswoman Norton, if you could just speak to a few of the issues that you think are most pressing for the people of DC uh, outside of the statehood context, but um, are there any issues, housing, healthcare, things that you think are important that um, could be more easily addressed if we were a state? Well, there are many issues pressing for DC and I've been <laughs> probably um, most important is housing, but none of those issues. Remember, I get to vote uh, in committee and vote on most matters affecting the District of Columbia. And most of those would not be affected by statehood. They are affected by my being in the majority. 
Uh, housing is perhaps the most critical one for the residents of the District of Columbia today because housing is so expensive. Uh, we've been able to get through the most recent coronavirus bill, many, many uh, of the uh, uh, of, of what the residents of, of the District of Columbia need. So uh, I think we've covered some of what DC residents most need in the questions that Professor Francois asked, uh, asked me. Great, well, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, like I said, if anybody has interest in joining our club or uh, working on these issues, feel free to reach out uh, to me by email, or you can feel free to look us up on Facebook. It's the Georgetown Law Students for Democratic Reform, or GLSDR. Um, thanks again so much for coming, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you again, Congresswoman Norton.